internet connection goes down two minutes before the show starts. But Bob, I'm going to intro the show because uh, I missed what you were saying. So welcome uh, to SLU and our live coverage of the Wolf Moon Penumbral Lunar Eclipse. Now, this event, Bob may have already said this, but this event marks SLU's 17th year of live astronomy with our first telescopes going online in 2003. And since then, we have had tens of thousands of amateur astronomers and space enthusiasts of all interests and expertise level uh, enjoying controlling SLU's robotic telescopes at this observatory that we're looking at right now. And they have captured millions of celestial images uh, from the live feeds that they watch every night uh, at our observatories here in the Canary Islands and in Chile. Uh, so if you haven't already joined SLU, sign up tonight to join our worldwide community. And if you know anybody who's not a member yet, get them to sign up because we do have a special seven day trial offer if you join today. Uh, but anyway, uh, Bob, back to our event tonight. The next couple of hours, we're not gazing at galaxies or nebulae or star clusters or planets. We're gonna be a lot closer to home uh, to watch our moon as it passes into Earth's outer shadow. Uh, in what is, I think we would describe, wouldn't we, Bob, as the subtlest type of eclipse there is. Yes, this is this is subtle. Uh, now, for, for those of us who love subtlety, you know, relationships where you say hello to someone who looks beautiful and they just barely give you the time of day, and they say, oh, hi, how are you doing? Uh, people like things like that, you know, that, that aren't really there, that aren't really immersive, but are subtle, and this offers some benefits, and that is instead of an in-your-face event, for example, a total solar eclipse, you can't help but see those pink flames shoot off from the edge of the sun or notice that day has turned to night and stuff like that. No, tonight we have that wolf moon, as some tribes call it, although most Native Americans had different names for it, but it's the full moon of January, and this moon is going into, as Paul said, our outer shadow. And so how does that differ from anything else? That's what we're going to be exploring. Exactly. Now, um, just before the show, I mean, we've been waiting. Uh, the eclipse kind of started a little bit earlier, but we've been waiting for the Canary Islands Observatory to open, where all of the big telescopes are that SLU members use and control every night. But just before, um, just yeah, about 20 minutes ago, I popped outside here in the UK, and just through the clouds, I was able to see the moon bob now i got my wife over as well to have a look because i know we've both said you know these penumbral lunar eclipses can be incredibly difficult to spot visually um but when we were looking and i i had to, i did have to point it out to my wife but we saw a very distinct shadowing down at the bottom right of the moon now we've got a, a an image here uh from uh slew member carol botha now she's in cape town in south africa and she took this photo uh, about 35 minutes ago. And this shows exactly what I was seeing out in my garden. So the studio will call that up. Um, and it's a very good, um, Carol's photo uh, gives a very good indication, illustration. There we go, of how it looked visually to me. So we can just see there, Bob, her, her image is, is orientated slightly differently. So just off at the top right, we can just see there's a definite shading there isn't there yes there is and notice that her moon is upside down relative to britain or where i am here in the mountains of eastern new uh united states uh because she she's standing on her head uh on the part of the earth that's upside down i don't know why she's not falling off but before <laughs> she does look at how her camera shows an upside down moon from the way we see it the, the famous woman in the moon the woman in profile is is upside down so yep yeah. and there's that shading so let's take a look, uh, because I haven't actually had a chance to look at uh, our live telescope fees first. We're going to go to the Pico del Tedi cam, first of all. Now, uh, for those of you who know SLU, uh, our flagship observatory is located at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. And here is the view from high up. This is at 10,000 feet on what's called Pico del Tedi, which is a volcanic cone. And we're looking down. So at the bottom of that image, you can see this black thing. And that's actually the ridge of the island of Tenerife. We see it as a ridge because what we're doing here is we're looking down on the clouds. We are so high up.
But there we can see blazing away in the night sky, there is our moon. And I don't know if you can make this out, Bob, but um, on the just to the left of where my picture is, we can just see Orion on its side. I can see the uh, the belt of Orion. Oh, there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. see that. Yep. So let's yep. Uh, zoom in a little bit more. So let's go back to the panorama. So this shows this huge panorama uh, of the entire um, observatory site. And there are tens of telescopes there. All the big professional telescopes are there. And of course, they're joined by the telescopes we're about to have a look at. Um, the SLU telescopes that SLU members use every single night. So here we can see that actually in the bottom left, we can just see Pico del Tedi. That's where that last camera was looking down from. So that kind of gives you some perspective. Now, what we've got here, if you look at the top of this image, there, there's that big sky bright dome behind Pico del Tedi. Well, that's where the sun has set because the sun only set about an hour or two ago, hour and a half ago. And in the left hand side, that's our moon rising. And we can hop off and see the dome cam actually and see if it's still visible in the dome cam because this dome uh, dome cam normally looks at the SLU dome so that we can see those during the day and watch the telescopes at night. Uh, well, we slewed it round to the east so that we could capture the, uh, the moon rising. So I don't know if the studio's got that, have we? And then we're gonna take a look at our all sky camera to see exactly where the moon is. And maybe Bob, if we can see anything else. There it is. So this is live, this is a live uh, stream from that camera. And we can just see there, we're looking down on the clouds once again, and there's the moon rising. Now, Bob, when we did this with a total lunar eclipse, um, a short uh, last year, we actually saw the redness of the eclipse, to the totally eclipsed moon rising but in this view we can't tell that it's in any kind of eclipse but we may be able to in some of our telescopes views but let's go to our canary all sky camera now bob ex explain what we see in our all sky camera in in tenerife when that comes up here we go looks like daylight doesn't it yes it does because the 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 full moon actually does make the sky blue you can see it mm. subtly even in your own eyes uh, if you go out tonight if you have clear skies uh, you'll see a, a hint of the blue, but with any kind of uh, good equipment that's um, really bringing in the light, you can see that there's plenty of uh, a blue sky even at night. So the, the moon is bright, and it's only going to get a little less bright. And uh, I think we're going to speak over and over again about how um, what the penumbral eclipse means. And we're going to be talking about a lot of aspects of the moon, its influence in... Uh, yeah. In, in, in human beings, in mental illness, in crime, in in uh, how you can tell looking at the moon when it was smashed into by what and at what period and how yeah. the same things were happening to the earth, unfortunately, that were happening to the moon. There's so much to talk about. But while we're doing that, I, I'd like to periodically remind uh, people that the, that we have that word eclipse and it's one of those words that can mean anything that covers a huge spectrum of events there's a few words like that earthquake is another one an earthquake could be a a, a a tremor that you barely feel or it could be something that destroys the city and kills a million people and we have that one word it's an earthquake and and it it, yeah. it carries a range of possible meanings an eclipse does the same thing. It can range from a total solar eclipse that changes people's lives and that people weep when they see it. They're so touched, it's so powerful. And it's uh, people are lucky if they see one in a, in a lifetime because they're so rare. Two, the other, I'd say the absolute other end of this scale when it comes to eclipse is what we're seeing tonight. It's a penumbral eclipse. It, it's fascinating in its own right because of what's happening. but let's be clear there's not a dramatic change in the full moon so we are yeah. we are looking at, at at subtlety here and we uh, and, and part of the the thrill of science is to dissect uh, grades of um of 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 what's happening when there is like the tick tock clockwork mechanism of the solar system causing things to happen they're not yeah. always in your face dramatic effects like day turning into night and, and, and flame shooting from the edge of the sun, that kind of thing. Something else oh, tonight. So that's what we're focusing yeah. on. 
I mean, we have got loads to get through. And I did just, because I was late joining the show, I should have been doing this a little bit. We haven't even got to our main live feeds yet. So I would like to carry on and, and just get through these so that viewers can actually see our live telescope views. So what we are seeing here is the all sky view, which is a 180 degree field of the entire sky. We've got the moon rising there over in the north um, northeast. And just to the left there, you can see the slough domes. Now we're going to go over two the live feed. So we'll have Canary 2 ultra wide field. This is a telescope with a huge field of view. What a fabulous shot there, Bob. If it, it, this is this is what I was saying to you, I, I think when we were doing the solar eclipse on Christmas Day, you know, this is incredibly difficult to spot these penumbral lunar eclipses visually when you're outside because almost the glare of the lit portion of the moon, the fully lit portion of the moon is so bright. It's difficult to see the contrast, but here we can see, I think, quite clearly, you know, the lower, the lower right. What, what do you make of this image, Bob? Oh, it's just wonderful because just off the edge of the moon now on the lower right, as you say, is the dark main umbral shadow of our planet Earth. And the moon mm. is just skimming through, just barely missing that part of the shadow but is going through the outer shadow called the penumbral shadow. We should really clarify what that means. The next yes, time do. you're walking down the street and casting a shadow from the sunlight onto the snow or onto a sidewalk, preferably a white surface so you can see it, uh, look closely at your own shadow or hold up a hand and look at the shadow of your hand, look at it very closely, and you'll see that there's really two parts to the shadow. There's that darkest area in the center of the shadow where the sun is totally blocked out, but then there is this fuzzy edge to it, and that's what we're talking about. That fuzzy edge that perhaps an ant on the sidewalk could take a maybe a few minutes to walk past. If the ant was in that fuzzy part, you know what they'd see? They would not see the sun totally blocked out, nor would they see the sun untouched. From there, ant-like perspective uh, with those zillions of little eye sections that they have that probably have a name and somebody who's into entomology probably could tell us what they're seeing is the sun partially blocked out so what we're seeing if we were on the moon right now looking back towards earth you'd be seeing the uh, sun slightly blocked out by uh, a section of the earth but most of the sunlight still hitting the moon and uh, so uh, it's not even quite a partial eclipse and a partial eclipse some parts of the moon are see the sun totally blocked out others see the full sun etc not tonight right now only part of the sun is blocked out for almost all of the moon so it's an unusual effect it is and, and one of the other um aspects of this penumbral eclipse is we don't see any color change even when we're using our color cameras and what what surprised me last year in our partial solar eclipse we, we tend to only associate the moon going blood red people call it a blood moon but I always think it's more peachy or, or pink um, we associate that with a total lunar eclipse when the entire moon is totally within the central umbral shadow of the earth but last year's partial eclipse that we covered where the moon only partially went in to that umbral shadow i was surprised at just how much color change we saw there bob in our canary three images which we were able to use and that uses a, a color camera yep and we're gonna have that again it's a strange year this year we're gonna have mm -hmm. four lunar eclipses that are all penumbral yeah, Next penumbral. year, yeah. we're going to have two lunar eclipses, and none of them are penumbral. Next year, both right. eclipses will be uh, very nice partial eclipses, and one of them, although it's called a partial, will be about 99% eclipse. So we'll have all the effects that you'd normally get in a total lunar eclipse happening. So two years right next to each other, 2020 and 2021, with, with lunar eclipses of plenty, six together combined in these two years, and yet the eclipses are very different from each other. Exactly. Now, I've got some questions for you about that um, in, a, in a couple of minutes' time. But let's just uh, finish off this little, um, this little bit with our last two telescope views, our live telescope images. So let's go to uh, Canary 1, if the studio have got that lined up. Now, this telescope is our mighty half-metre telescope. And that is a huge telescope for anybody who's in Europe or you know, anywhere else. I was about to say Europe or the UK. We've still got about 
three weeks left of being in Europe. Um, there's a calamity for you. Oh, my God, what have we done? Um, anyway, here we go. We don't normally use this huge telescope. So it's a half meter diameter because the moon is too bright for this colossal telescope. But we change a few little things in its configuration tonight for these lunar eclipses. And here we can see. But I mean, I, I, I love it when we use the half meter telescope for the moon. I mean, it's it's absolutely it's stunning, isn't it? It's stunning, Paul, yes, and you know what else I'd like to do at some point, we talked about this, is that since we have a panoramal eclipse that lets us still see the lunar features yeah. during the entire We're going to talk about those. Yes, we have the time to look at them, and this is the only, I mean, think about it, it's the only celestial object that the human eye can see without equipment and just look up and actually see features of, and we're going to talk about how Looking at these different features that you can see, yes, here's a close-up. Sure, our telescope could zoom in, but that previous view shows you what just the naked eye would see, or especially enhanced with perhaps binoculars that many of us, of course, have lying around somewhere. And we can see the geological periods of the moon and how we know what's what and what part of the moon formed when. And then there's that added effect that whatever was happening on the moon was happening on the Earth at the same time because uh, periods of impacts affected us as well as the moon. So we're going to see an interesting storyline. We're going to open up a book yeah. and see the actual history of the moon and the Earth right there in front of us on the moon tonight. So I'd, I'd just like to explain to viewers on this one, this is our last live telescope stream coming in from the Canary Islands Observatory tonight. And this is our Canary 4 solar system telescope as you can see it has a far smaller field of view so that's what makes it look so zoomed in but when we talk bob i think when we talk about these these ge geological features uh, we need to find the word for that don't we um on the moon i think we'll probably use the canary one telescope for that but just one question before we get to that you were mentioning the fact that we've got four penumbral eclipses lunar eclipses this year we've got two solar eclipses we've got another ring of fire eclipse an annular eclipse and then we've got the great total solar eclipse that's going over chile and argentina on december 14th now how unusual is it to have four penumbral eclipses lunar eclipses in the same year very very the fact that we have uh, uh, those uh, couple of solar, four lunar, that's almost as many eclipses as you can possibly have. And the fact that all the lunar eclipses are penumbral, you'd have to go back a lot of years. And I didn't look this up lazily before the show, but uh, it, it, it's a very, very rare occurrence, what, what we're seeing. So this is the first of them. Well, if, if, if I had done my planned introduction, I was going to introduce you tonight as the, as the walking astronomical encyclopedia, Bob. Um, because you, you you normally have these these facts off the top of your head, which are absolutely extraordinary. But let's get to what we were going to talk about. Then. So here we're looking once again at our Canary One half meter telescope at our flagship observatory in the Canary Islands Institute of Astrophysics at the Canary Islands. This telescope is one of the many telescopes that SLU members control every single night. Some people do astrophotography with it. Some people just collect beautiful color images of galaxies and nebulae and star clusters and stars and planets and all sorts of other things. Uh, other people do loads of science with it, making, I think the, the, the team who monitor asteroids have now made over 7,000 submissions to the Minor Planet Center where they measure the precise location and orbits of near-Earth asteroids, those asteroids that, that threaten Earth. But here we are then, Bob, this stunning image stream coming in from the Canary One telescope. First of all, how does the composition of the moon differ from that uh, of Earth? We, we, we think they were kind of made of a giant collision, so they're probably made of the same stuff, aren't they? Yeah, a little bit mysterious there, Paul, because uh, indeed all the evidence points to a, a collision between a very large object, probably half the size of Earth, that we've posthumously, posthumously because it got destroyed in the event, named Theia. And when Theia collided with us, it was a head-on collision, destroyed Theia, and chunks of the Earth, white-hot chunks, flew into space. Chunks of Theia flew up also, 
and uh, together they eventually coalesce to form the moon. So it means, yes, what you're saying, the moon is partially made of earthly material, which helps explain uh, some of the astonishing oddities of the moon's composition. Astonishing, astonishing. So but, uh, is, there any, is there any way these, these features of the moon that we're looking at here, the craters, the mare, the seas, the mountain ranges, is, is there any story that they tell of the moon's history uh, and its composition, actually? Oh, they, they sure do. They sure do. We've divided the uh, moon into, the, we can call it geologic periods. That's usually used, even though geo means of the earth. But geological periods, um, the moon was formed uh, almost, uh, well, more than four billion years ago, between four and four and a half billion years ago. That's when the collision happened. And so we say that everything that happened to the moon between that initial cooling down from a liquid state to a solid state, we, we, uh, we, we give it that oldest uh, possible uh, label. We call it the pre-nectarian. And then after that, about 4 billion years ago, 3.9 billion years, comes the nectarian period. So since those first two, there's only five periods. So all of those first two have the word nectar or nectarian in it. <laughs> Let's take a look with this uh, using the telescope here and see what we're talking about. It was named that because there was a giant impact that it got filled with lunar lava and it's mare, mare means sea because the older observers like Galileo and others in 1610 thought that all these dark blotches were oceans, water, seas. So they're all still called uh, maria or maria, that's the plural, uh, for seas. But the oldest we think is Mare Nectaris, the Sea of Nectars. I'll show you how to find them. They're all named after either uh, weather phenomena or human emotions, kind of crazy. Weather phenomena or emotions. For example, I don't have a pointer here, but look at that very small, perfectly round one on the right side of the moon. You see sort of the okay. upper right of the moon where a clock yep talking about the two o'clock position. There's one that's very uh, quite small and quite round. You see that? That's yep. Mare Crisium, Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crises. So always remember, it's going to have a name that has to do with human emotions, in this case, a crisis, like you almost went through when you couldn't get on the show earlier exactly. today. Exactly. <laughs> and we've all known from time to time, you know, psychological crises. Sea of Crises uh, over there. Well, you look just below it, and you'll see sort of a double blotch, okay? The blotch below it and onto the left is the famous Mare Tranquillitatis. That's the sea of tranquility. Again, a human emotion, tranquility. Too many of us uh, don't have that and seek for it, tranquility, but I'm not gonna editorialize. To the right of the sea of tranquility, and meaning just below, directly below Mare Crisium. Again, Mare Crisium is that little, that small one at the two o'clock position on the moon, right near the limb or the edge of the moon. Okay, the one just below that um, is uh, Mare Fecunditis, and that means Ooh. the sea of fertility. Say sea that of again, fertility. Tom. I'm sorry? Say that What's again that? slowly. Mare Fecunditis. Okay, or fecunditatis, the sea of fertility. Fecund, fecund, fecund is an old fashioned word to say fertile. So it's the sea of fertility. Now, so we've seen under that round one at the upper right hand corner, that's the sea of crises, Mare Crisium. We've seen below it is that double blotch, the one on the, the blotch on the left is the sea of tranquility. The blotch on the right is the, the sea of fertility. And now look below them, because that's really what I'm getting to here. Below them, you have misshapen this, is, this one, isn't it? Yes, the the one the most the odd the most irregular shape is probably the Sea of Tranquility. But now below them both, all by itself, there is another small, pretty round uh, sea. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yep. That yep. is the Mare Nectaris. That's the Sea of Nectars. And that's the oldest, we think, the very oldest impact where some meteor hit it, scooped out a giant crater, which thanks to the heat got filled with upwelling lava from below. And so we rate the earliest, oldest periods of the moon pre-Nectarian for the time before that even formed. 
and the Nectarian about 3.9 billion years ago, long time ago, mm-hmm. when that particular uh, mare formed. So give, you're, us a, you're, give, us a, give us a sense of scale here, Bob. What, what kind of size are any of these mare that you, you've mentioned? Good, good question. The moon from one side to the other is 2,162 miles. Say from New York on the right, to uh, Denver, Colorado on the left. Uh, That would be the the whole size of the moon. So it's easy to interpolate and figure that these, that uh, the Sea of Nectars that we're talking about, oh, would probably be, yeah, it would be maybe a 10th or a 15th of that size. So Mm. we're talking about uh, 150 miles across something like that. Yes, see. Now, let's go back uh, I, I, you know, I'm not going to keep blabbing about this because we're going to periodically return to these geological periods of the moon. But we'll we'll do one more. We've already talked about the the uh, pre-nectarian and the nectarian, all based on that sea of nectars that we just looked, spotted. Let's do one more sea. Again, go yes. up to that upper right. Start with the uh, the sea of Chryseis, Mare Chrysium. That's that perfectly round one at the two o'clock position, near the limb, near the edge, on the upper right of the moon. We all see that, right? Now, yep. previously we looked directly to the left of that, and the rather large, large irregular blob is the famous sea of tranquility, where the first, and by the way, also the last uh, Apollo astronauts landed. Yep both in uh, July of 69 and in December of 72. Now look above the Sea of Tranquility. To the upper left, there is another blob that's just about the same size as the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, Can you see that? Yep, and and a a little bit more defined than the Sea of Tranquility. Exactly, quite right. The edges are better behaved. They're, they're, Mm. they're, they're, They're not as irregular. Uh, they, they, they're, they're pretty nice, nice and almost uh, smoothly defined. Uh, well said, well said. That's the Sea of Serenity, Mare Serenitatis. That's the Latin, the uh, the, the uh, Sea of Serenity. Now continue left from there. Go kind of over the bulge of the moon. Go to the left from there, and you get to a much larger sea, yeah, the largest yeah. one that we've been speaking of so far. And qu- and when you look at it, it's quite round too, isn't it? But it's huge. And, and we that, can see there, I think, Bob, some some fairly obvious mountain ranges, kind of picked out quite quite white. That kind of white rim. That's a mountain range on yes, the edge of this, isn't it? Yes, on the lower on the lower edge, those are the lunar Apennines, the Apennine Mountains of the Moon, and gorgeous through a telescope at other phases of the Moon, other than full like yes. tonight. Yeah. The shadowing is the gorgeous, but there is Mare Imbrium, okay. and Mare Imbrium uh, is uh, is is very important because the Imbrian period uh, came next in the Moon's geological history. So we have the pre-Nectarian the nectarian, and then the next was the imbrium, when that huge, gigantic, humongous, imagine the size of whatever hit the moon to make that very round escarpment. And at the bottom of it, yes, there's that white streak, which is the lunar Apennine Mountains. And let that white streak point you to the lower left to a very, very white, round crater. Can't even tell it's a crater because it's so white, it doesn't look like a hole. And if you look closely, you'll see rays, white rays, streaming yeah. out of it in all directions. This is the famous crater Copernicus. And I mention that because the most recent period of the moon, and I promise I'll shut up after this. I'm just going to jump to the most no, recent. No, carry on, Bob. Me- meaning, the, meaning just the most recent billion years on the moon. It's We're still in that period, is the Copernican period. And this is marked by craters that are so new that they've left white ray systems, which get erased after time, uh, uh, from around them. So look around the moon and you'll see different places where you see craters, white, white holes that have white lines streaming. In some cases, the one near the bottom, which is Tycho, have white lines or rays that stream, in some cases, clear across the moon's sure. surface, almost yeah. from one side to the other. Uh, so the, the, the time when craters could leave those kind of white streaks is the most recent in the lunar's history. That's the that's the Copernican period. So I'm going to stop now, but just to give you an idea that seeing these features on the moon really tells you 
uh, of the different geological ages and also tells you what was happening on Earth because whenever the moon was getting hit a lot, we were getting hit a lot. So studying the moon through the SLU telescopes or if you have a backyard telescope uh, is opening up a storybook where you turn page after page, meaning millennium after millennium, eon after eon, showing you the history of this part of the solar system. Well, I'm not going to let you get off the hook that easily, Bob, but you're going to join us again in half an hour's time. And I think we should continue a little bit of that story, that history of the, the moon's geology, if you like, um, and its bombardment ever since. And in fact, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't stopped. You know, amateur astronomers have, have spotted several impacts, you know, just in the last few years to their video systems and things like this. But we're also going to be talking when you get back about a little bit of uh, moon mythology and, and maybe some of the impacts that the moon is said to have on human fertility and maybe a few other topics like that. So, Bob, thank yes. you so much for, for joining us in this first segment and thank you very much for catching the beginning of this show. We'll see you back in 30 minutes time. OK, Paul, see you then. Now, don't go anywhere, folks, because uh, joining me in, uh, in a couple of minutes time after a short break is going to be Dr. Mike Shaw. Uh, now, Mike Shaw runs the uh, Nightscape Club uh, over in the SLU community, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about SLU, we're going to be talking about the eclipse, um, but then Bob Berman is going to join us again, and then Bob's, uh, sorry, Mike Shaw is going to join us at the end of the show. Now, if you were lucky enough to get, uh, maybe Santa sent you a, a nice DSLR camera or some other kind of, even a phone, actually, we're going to talk about how you can use your phone. If you're interested in taking some really cool nightscape shots, then Mike is going to tell us that in our last segment of the show. So don't go anywhere. All right. So uh, we are going to be right back after this short break with more of our, I mean, look at this. This is our uh, Tady 2 ultra wide field telescope. And we're still seeing the bottom uh, right hand part of the moon. You can see we've got that subtle shading. This is the subtlest of all types of eclipse. So uh, we will see you right after this break. Bye for now.
Hello and welcome back to Slew's live coverage of tonight's Full Wolf Moon Penumbral Lunar Eclipse. There's a mouthful for you, uh, to friends out there. Uh, we'll just call it the Lunar Eclipse for tonight. And here we can see it in our live feeds. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, point out you know, what we're actually seeing in those live feeds. Uh, but just to let you know, we are SLU is now celebrating its 17th year, would you believe, of operation. We launched our first live telescope for people around the world to use on Christmas Day 2003. Hopefully you caught our 16th anniversary celebration. Uh, what a night that was. On Christmas night, we had a spectacular ring of fire solar eclipse. And uh, we've got one of those coming up later this year as well. So you've got to keep your eyes peeled to SLU all year round. But, you know, a lot of people watch our shows and they don't realise, actually, that SLU members use these telescopes every single night. They control these telescopes that we're looking at now, looking through now. So if you're interested, we've got a special promotion on at the moment. If you join today, you'll get a seven day free trial. And uh, I have to say the community, we talk about it a lot at SLU, but the community is so cool at SLU. Um, everybody you know, remembers how difficult astronomy could be when you're starting out, but everybody's a helping hand there for you. And they'll guide you through how to use the telescopes, what you're looking at, and you can chat and you can join clubs and all sorts of stuff. And of course, you can join clubs uh, like Dr. Mike Shores. He runs the Nightscape Club over at SLU and he teaches basically every single week, teaches all SLU members who want to learn how to take amazing Nightscape astro photographs. So without further ado, Mike is joining us now. Hello, Mike, how are you? I'm just fine, Paul. How are you doing this afternoon, evening, morning? Yeah, it's always difficult, isn't it? You know, and, and whenever I kind of think about the intro to one of these shows, my inclination is always to say, hello, good evening, if it's evening here, or, you know, good morning, if it's morning, wherever I am. But, you know, so I try and be very neutral about that and just say <laughs> a general welcome to SLU. But anyway, a happy new year to you. I, I think we haven't chatted so far this year. I know it's the 10th, but you know, let's still say happy new year. And a happy Mike. new year to you and to all the other folks that are listening. I, I do know what, of what you speak when we do the, you mentioned the Nightscapes Club and our weekly audio show every Tuesday night. And what's interesting to me is we have people dialing in some familiar uh, faces out there from South Africa and from New yeah. Zealand and the UK. And some people it's three o'clock in the morning, they, they get up some exactly. people it's high noon and for me, it's the middle of the night, so I don't know even know where to start with the uh, with the greetings. But we'll just say, I guess, felicitations and happy new year. Exactly, and and you know, you you do get people out of bed. We have seen we slew do. members uh, we saying. Just, I just wanted to say thank you for it, all of your exactly. Uh, uh, they you they know. set their alarm and get up for your audio show when it's three a.m. for them. So Talking yeah, to that you. has <laughs> that that has a. a, a more to do with your expertise and the, the way you share that expertise during those audio shows. It's a anyway, great community and I think we all have a great time with it, but um, thank you for that. Exactly. Yeah. Mike, let's take a, a, a step through the live feeds because I want to get your reaction to these let's first of all. Let's, um, let's take a look at uh, the panorama if we can studio, um, because this kind of sets the scene for us a little bit. This is uh, the uh, observatory where SLU's telescopes are, Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, and you can see actually we're looking down on the ocean and the clouds. Yep. It's always nice, isn't it, Mike, when we're looking down on the clouds rather than trying to <laughs> peer through them. Yes, I we and, and we I'm right I'm based in the twin cities of Minneapolis, and more often than not, we're on the other sides of the clouds looking up at them. So there's always a great thing to get these marvelous panoramic views of the observatories and the clear blue skies. They just there's no clouds in them, so you know the humidity is low and it's just great yeah. viewing conditions. Now, uh, let's go over to the all sky camera because I, I did want to point something out. You know, we're looking at a blue sky there, but, you know, we know it's nighttime. And if we look at the all sky camera, Bob mentioned this. There we are. The bright, great big bright thing there is actually the moon rising still under its eclipse. But the sky is blue. Now, we were showing a group of Girl Scouts um, the live telescope views last night because they've all joined their whole troop has wow, joined job, SLU, really which cool. is really, really cool. And they've got their own private club in SLU and nice, they're all using the telescopes nice. and stuff like that. But one of the things when they were looking at the, the live telescope views last night, especially in our Canary 3 telescope, they said, why are the images 
blue. They had a kind of blue hue. So you could still see the, the nebula or the galaxy or the star cluster, but the background was kind of blue. And here it is, Mike. This is, here it is. This is yes. why it's the moon makes the sky look blue. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking like this through this particular camera right. or you're That's looking right. through one of the telescopes. So, But let's take a look, because this has been my favorite view so far, uh, the Canary mm -hmm. One half yes. meter telescope. Now, Mike, I know that this is one of your favorite telescopes here at SLU. Can you can you tell me why? Oh, it's just I think it's for some of the things that we uh, like to look at through the the Nightscapes Club. It's one of the ones that we use uh, quite frequently. It has the ability to zero in on the deep sky objects of interest. And to, the reason we like that is that the the um, I think the special appeal of the the Nightscapes theme to the club members is that you know these days it's relatively common to capture, let's say, a, a, a shot of the Milky Way or a starry night sky, mm -hmm. let's say, for example. And what most people don't recognize are some of the deep sky treasures that are hidden inside these images. And, you know, you might see a, a fuzzy little patch that over here or a little, little spot of color over there, but most of the photographers just sort of pass by those. But with the slew telescopes, like the, uh, the Canary One, for example, we can schedule the missions that you talked about to zero in on let's say the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a, a nearby galaxy that uh, you can really see in some amazing detail, or you can capture some of the emission nebula that have these amazing colors that um, people really are drawn to, or the reflection nebula that also have a completely different type of color palette. And it's these deep sky objects that you can see through the SLU telescopes that when you match them up with the nightscape images, that, that combination is really a, a neat thing to appreciate because the images themselves are not that often, are not that different from what you and I can see when we step outside and look through the all sky camera like we do here, or we just look up in the sky with our naked eyes. So I think it's that combination that really hits the jackpot. And it has this, it's, it's SLU's largest telescope. So it has this huge light gathering capability. You know, it collects oh, photons, it munches through all of those. And, <laughs> you know, if, if somebody wanted a telescope like this in their own backyard, you're talking nearly $200,000. Right. For, for, for equipment like this. I mean, the, the camera alone on the back of this telescope, which is giving us this live stream now, you know, you're talking fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. And that's without all of the, the ancillary stuff, you know, a single filter that we're oh, using. Amazing, the, filter, yeah. the, the, the filter that we're using for the moon is a special type of filter tonight. And that alone costs $800, Mike. I mean, <laughs> the, these figures are oh, astounding. It's, 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 and, you know, it really, really it, are. even if, even if an amateur astronomer does have that kind of cash to splash around, you know, <laughs> I, I, I live in England, actually live in a good part, the southwest of England. Okay. I probably get about two or three nights. I know that's an exaggeration, but I probably get <laughs> about nice. two or I three mean, clear nights because yeah. it has to be a weekend because you're working the rest of the time. So you can't right. stay up late. But anyway, oh, yeah, what yeah. do you what do you make of our, our eclipse image? It's a very subtle, isn't it, Mike? This this penumbral it really lunar is. eclipse. Yeah, you know, that's the, um, you know, one of the uh, things that comes, whenever I think of a penumbral uh, eclipse, listening to Bob speak it just a few minutes ago, there was a, uh, uh, one of the discussions a while ago came up, there was an emanations of the penumbra, and I always thought that would be a good name for a band, but, you know, it's a distinct, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a distinct uh, difference in coloration, but, you know, it really is there, and, you know, I think that's one of the you know, just as a, as a leading kickoff to this, I know I have several questions I wanted to ask you about the new equipment yeah. that you've just been involved with setting up um, over there and in Chile. And, you know, one of the things to me that always is uh, striking about these events, and this is a point that actually Bob made, uh, Bob Berman made, I think, in the last show or the show before that, is that while these uh, views that we see in themselves are truly striking in many, many ways, what's really extraordinary about these uh, views is what they really represent. And, you know, this notion of having the, uh, uh, the, the earth and the sun and the moon lined up. I mean, it, it's a sentence that comes out as an easy thing to say and to sort of visualize, but it's absolutely phenomenal to think about yeah. the, the earth, uh, the sun and the moon and the earth, you know, the sun and the earth and the moon, you know, lined up in such a way with such precision that you can actually capture this shadow. And there was a thing going around on Twitter the other day that showed a, a an image of the full moon like this with a thin rectangular uh, shadow on it. Basically, the caption was, this is the image of the uh, lunar eclipse that the flat earthers have never seen. 
<laughs> and so it's, uh, this is just, but to all humor aside, I mean, it's just, to me, it's always spectacular to see even this, this subtle penumbral eclipse. It has this in, this inexorability about it of the, of the, yeah. just the motion of the, the bodies in the cosmos. And I just find it to be absolutely magnificent to see that manifestation of those movements and the alignment and the precision with which we can predict that alignment and make these observations that we're looking at here. And we can just see them ourselves, like you say, and, you know, there's no way that we'd be able to afford a $200,000 uh, couple night a year. The family budget doesn't stretch that far. And to have it in such a fantastic location that we can just, yeah. we'd have to operate it remotely anyway. And why not? I just, I just think it's a great feature, Slu, to have that all put together. And the image here, and I'm looking at it on my, on my screen, is just so crisp and sharp. It's just, yeah. And I don't know whether to you know, look at you or to screen or. <laughs> it's it, exactly. And this is why people, I think, um, when they watch our shows, often, you know, we're not looking directly into our camera. And it's because we don't want to miss the live views either. <laughs> but, you know, this is very subtle. Now, it was at the maximum eclipse um, when the show started nearly an hour ago. So yep. the moon now is moving out of this outer um, Earth shadow. Um, so it is going to get more and more subtle but you know a, a lot of people do say that you know it's almost impossible to see a penumbral eclipse with the naked eye but you know I don't know if you heard Mike but I popped out 20 minutes before the show started just outside here and just through the thin clouds uh, and I, I because I knew what I was looking for I wanted to have somebody else's opinion so I could clearly see that you know a full moon it wasn't you know, evenly was a, illuminated. Yeah. There was a little bit of a shadow. In fact, quite what I thought was more distinct than I was I was thinking. So anyway, I asked my wife to come over and said, can you look at the full moon and tell me what you can see? And she said, there's a little dark bit in in the bottom right-hand corner. You know, yeah. so it, you, what, what amazes me when I see stuff like this is how many times I've looked at the moon, probably during a lunar eclipse at some point in my life before I really got interested in astronomy and actually have totally missed something, you know, and I know right. that I've missed major comets, you know, mm -hmm. these huge comets right. like Hale Bot, because I wasn't mm -hmm. sufficiently in, and I know I was driving to work directly <laughs> towards this thing every single mm -hmm. morning, but I yeah, probably yeah. just thought it was clouds or something like that. But I do want to yeah. take you back to something that you were talking about. Um, Nightscape Club. Yeah, yeah. So you were talking about you do this audio show and you've got the club in SLU and you're taking these wide field, almost landscape yes. shots with, you yeah. know, beautifully composed, but with features of um, the night sky in as well. Now we're going to talk about this in our last segment. So we're going to tell people yeah. how they can do this stuff. But yes. then you're using SLU's telescopes at the same thing. So what are you doing there, Mike? Are you kind of showing, you know, these are nightscape, you share nightscapes of, say, Orion, the whole constellation in the sky, and then you control the telescopes to look at things like the Orion Nebula or Betelgeuse, which is in the news at the moment because it might go supernova, although probably won't right. for another million years or something. But is, is that what you, you do there? Uh, yeah, that's certainly, that's exactly it. Uh, that's one branch of the tuning fork, so to speak. And that's certainly one of the, the great things we can do is we'll post a few images. Um, either I will post an image or the club members will post an image. Mm. And by the way, that's one of the great things about the, the club environment in SLU, and not just our club, but in your club and Bob's club and the other clubs that are out there, is that the club members themselves can post their cell phone shots, their camera shots, their SLU shots um, from the telescopes. And they're all up there and we all go through them and chat about them and uh, make comments yeah. and insights and so forth. But that's right. So we'll put up a shot of, let's say, um, you know, Perseus. And we'll look at the double. It was, we'll start we'll start off with a shot of Perseus over some, you know, beautifully composed foreground subject. But then we might zoom into the double cluster, for example. Or, you know, we'll have for the, the example that you use, the Orion. Then we'll look at, let's say, the, the Orion Nebula. Or we'll look at the Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula. Uh, through the SLU telescopes. And these are things that, you know, through a DSLR, you can just barely make these out. Um, yeah. And of course, with a longer lens, you can get, make that with pretty good detail. But to really get that um, that punch, it's really a great chance to look at the images through a, the SLU telescopes. And that's that's one branch of the, uh, the fork. The other one is some shows, some evenings, I mean, we've talked about things from, you know, star physics all the way through to galaxy formation to 
you know, nebula, uh, star clusters, different types of clusters, different types of nebula, and just give, just to have a chance to talk about these things in sort of an introductory way for the, the members and ourselves to just kind of kick around ideas and answer questions that people might have and to perhaps inspire people to create these um, uh, images that have these deep sky objects in them because really the it's kind of a it's like a fun puzzle to solve each week to uh, come up with a an image I mean if we if we have these images through the slew telescopes it's really a matter of finding you really want them to be the highest they could be in the sky so you get the best yeah. you know the least atmosphere to view them through but with a nightscape image you actually want them closer to the horizon generally so that you can appreciate the the, the context of the surrounding environment within the uh, that you can view these uh, images. So it's really, it's kind of a puzzle. It's like, well, when is exactly the Rosette Nebula going to be three degrees off the horizon? I don't know. I have to look that up. So that's that's kind of the, uh, the puzzle that we, and, uh, we talk about. And, and composition is so important. I'm not, we're not going to, um, we're not going to have a, a spoiler um, here, but you've got an absolutely stunning uh, example of one of your photographs of a lunar eclipse so we're going to show at the end of the show so studio please don't show that now um because we're going to we're going to look at how you did that mike um yes. because it's an absolutely extraordinary image but also oh, you know i i think in 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 the segment in about 35 minutes time that we'll do um we will we'll cover some of the basics for somebody who may have only just got you know a, a new dslr camera or you know, a mirrorless camera, or maybe a, a, a thinking of getting one. So maybe a little back to basics primer as well. Sure. What they could do yeah. on their first night, because there are so many settings on some of these cameras now, you know, it can be a bit of a minefield, just where do you start kind of thing. So maybe we can kick off with that. Happy to do that. That's a great that idea. Thing. That this so, really is, because this is, yeah, we'll look forward to that. So uh, Mike, uh, we, we, we've, you know, we've got an, another five minutes in this segment. I know that you had some questions. You said because we haven't I caught do. up I, so I, far I, this year, uh, and these I, are these questions that viewers will be interested in hearing the answer to as well, or are we just going to have I a think so. Way? I mean, let's just say, I, th I really do think so because you know we've been you know all of us across SLU and all the different clubs I know have been following your travels in Chile. The oh, yeah. the, well, you know what's inside the box to seeing the box on the back of a pickup truck, and maybe you could just take a moment and uh, you know just. Uh, share with us some of the, um, I mean, I understand the uh, the new uh, telescope that you installed, the plane wave uh, CD, uh, CVK-17 is a, is a monstrous equipment and it's yeah. got some really nice focusing features and things like this. So maybe you could just take yeah. a minute and just share the great news with the broader community about what you've been up to. Yeah, so I, I think it's it's probably, I, I was going to say this in my introduction, but, you know, as you know, um, I reckon I had a denial of service attack because it just wiped my router out. And that's the second oh, time that's man. happened two minutes before the show started. But anyway, just um, it, it, exactly something happened. But uh, I was going to say that, you know, we're using the um, Canary Islands Observatory, SLU's Canary Islands Observatory tonight, which has great coverage of the northern hemisphere sky. It's up at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, 8000 feet above the ocean, superb seeing conditions. So we get this beautiful clarity in all of the live image streams. But, you know, we only had that um, observatory. That was the only one that we had for four years until 2000, 2007. We, we missed a whole half of the sky, the Southern Hemisphere. And actually, the Southern Hemisphere skies, I believe, are some of the richest. So in Agreed. partnership with the Catholic University in Chile, we put a huge dome, an 18-foot dome, um, at their observatory where they have a couple of large telescopes and we've been running that since 2007 um, but as you say last year was an absolutely momentous year for us because our largest telescope there was uh, about 350 millimeters in diameter and that's a 14 inch telescope which is a pretty big nice telescope story. you know but for an amateur astronomer that's going to set you back a penny or two and don't forget you know the telescope's just one bit you then have to put it on a mount and that mounts 12 grand. You then have to have a camera on the back of it. That's between five and 16 grand plus everything else. But what we had and what we, we've been looking at actually tonight, this is our half meter telescope, 500, um, 500 millimeter diameter, 21 inches, 20 inches. But we also have a 17 inch telescope in the Canary Islands, which we're not using for the moon tonight, but SLU members control every night. And that's a, a perfect kind of middling telescope. And we thought, 
wouldn't it be great if we could have one of those down at our Chile observatory? Because it will be perfectly matched for some of those southern hemisphere gems in the sky. So last year, as you say, uh, we, we teased everybody mercilessly last year at the beginning of the year. In fact, I think it was about midway through the year. This humongous wooden crate turned up at SLU HQ um, in Connecticut. And we didn't give anything away. We hadn't announced that we were launching this telescope or going to install it. So we basically just published this photo and said, guess what's in here, folks? And we had some good guesses, but nobody, I don't think, actually guessed just how big the telescope was. And they certainly didn't know that it was going to go chilly. Um, so long story short, just before Christmas, um, I finished off a three week uh, trip down to Chile to install that. Now, if anybody's interested in seeing these are pretty awesome photos, I, I was so pleased. They were just done with my phone, these photos um, under the red light of the, uh, the observatory mm -hmm. lights. Um, on the very last night of the trip, this new telescope, and oh, it's a oh, it's stunning, amazing. I mean, it stunning really is. It just piece. makes you salivate. Yeah, you know, it, it is. It, it's it's tactile like that, Mike. It's made of carbon fiber. These beautiful <laughs> CNC, you know, parts to it. You know, and, yeah. and you do. You just want to stroke it almost. <laughs> um, but that was installed, and uh, all of the hardware was installed and finished just before Christmas. So I got home just in time for Christmas. In fact. I'm being very green. I'm still using my chili water bottle here. Um, <laughs> so nice. uh, from the from the flight, but that is going to be the 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 software guys, the development team uh, in Connecticut. They they are finishing off some work on some other work to do with quests, which are really great, cool activities that um, SLU members can do using telescopes. They're finishing off some work there. Then they're going to move on to just finalizing a bit of code to bring that new 17 inch telescope, that's 432 millimeters, I think, telescope online in Chile. That's amazing. Now we are gonna have a special show. And actually, Mike, uh, I'll put you on the spot here. It would be great if you could join me for that <laughs> show when we're going to have a special show for what's called First Light. First and I light. wondered whether oh. or not, I wondered whether Please. you could explain to viewers what, what that means. Well, this is like when you take a when you have a new ship and you take the champagne bottle and you smash it against the prow. Uh, first light is the event when you unveil the telescope to the heavens, and it's yeah. always a uh, special event to put it mildly when you uh, when you have this event. And it would be an honor, Paul, to uh, be any any part of that at all. So yes, please, you can count on that. That'll that that'll be a great great evening um, because. We're actually asking, we've already asked, and we're going to ask them again when we're closer to the time, to vote for what should be the celestial object, which is first light. <laughs> and and Good somebody... Luck with that. <laughs> exactly. It's going to be such a such a. That's going to be a. Uh, you know, that's going to be a good. That's going to be a feeding frenzy. I'd like to. I mean, it is. You could sort of. You could have an, what I'd recommend is that you ha you folks at, at the SLU HQ have a pool, as to uh, you know that. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But yeah, I can good. already and imagine people's tapping away in their keystrokes trying to like, hey, what are you going to exactly. vote for? I don't know. What are you going to vote for? Exactly. You know, and I, I was when I was installing the equipment, um, you know, you have to use it and you have to use the camera to do pointing models and focus calibrations and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And I was so tempted to point the new telescope to <laughs> a known celestial object. But I thought, no, because I no. want the first oh, yeah. light show to be truly this is the first time that telescope <laughs> captures you know a celestial object so That's it's going to be, be great fun yeah. so keep keep your eyes open uh, look out for the invite for that one mike now when yeah. we come back we're going to go to a break now um bob berman's going to join me again and we're going to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing in the lunar eclipse some of those geological features or lunar features, um, and also a little bit of mythology and stuff like that. But after that, uh, you're going to uh, join me again, Mike, in about half an hour. And to round out the show tonight, as the eclipse is just drawing to an end, and we, we get to see the full moon as it normally does, perfectly illuminated across the entire surface, you're going to give, give us a, a good little primer in how we can start some nightscape photography. And then people can join you next Tuesday 
for your audio show where hopefully you could kind of segue into whatever you can't cover tonight. You could cover for those new members next Tuesday. Definitely. That's sound look forward the plan? to all of that. Look forward okay, to all so I'll see, I'll see you in about 25 minutes, 30, 30 minutes time. Thanks very much for now, Mike. All right, cheers. And thank you, Ben. Now, viewers, as we still look uh, at all, oh, I was glad that the studio went back to this. It's my favorite view tonight. This is our Canary One half meter telescope uh, based at the Canary Islands Observatory. We can still see that this isn't an evenly illuminated full moon. We can see it's, it's getting more and more difficult to see because don't forget, this is the most subtle of all the eclipse types, of all lunar eclipses, of all solar eclipses. This is the most subtle of all of them. And it's now getting more and more difficult to see. But the part of the moon which is still just inside that outer shadow of the Earth is down at the bottom right hand corner, about the four or five o'clock position on the lunar disk. And you can see it's just darker, not like the dark moons, uh, the dark seas are up above. You can see there's a slight shade and there is a slight curvature to it. Now, I reckon within the next 15 or 20 minutes, that's going to be even more difficult to see. But in theory, this eclipse doesn't finish for another 45 minutes. That's when the moon edges its way out of that penumbral shadow. So anyway, don't go anywhere because we've still got so much more to talk about uh, with Bob Berman after the break and then Mike Shaw is going to be joining us a little bit later. So uh, we'll see you in two minutes time. Bye for now. Hello and welcome back. Uh, Paul Cox here and Bob Berman as well. Welcome back to SLU's live coverage of the Wolf Moon Penumbral Lunar Eclipse. Now, this is not a lunar eclipse here, Bob, that we're looking at, but we've been talking about the SLU community. And I wanted to get your opinion of this poster, which SLU member Cameron McEwing made. And it's his SLU eclipses of 2019. What do you make of this? It's Pretty cool, isn't it? The way Cameron has uh, has shown us this. We've got the total solar eclipse on the left with views through the SLU solar telescope and the size of the moon uh, through the SLU's telescope. And then on the right, we've got the ring of fire eclipse, which was that show that you joined me on on Christmas Day. I really enjoyed that show, by the way, where the moon is smaller than the sun on that day. What do you make of, of this presentation? It's superb, isn't it, Bob? It's superb, yes, and it really shows nicely how the moon changes its size thanks to its elliptical orbit, and sometimes it's uh, big enough to do the job. 
and fully cover the sun, and sometimes it just, uh, even though the eclipse is central, leaves behind a ring. So it's very, uh, very good. And we're, we're talking about a lunar eclipse tonight, um, but, you know, just while we've got this on the screen, this also represents the two solar eclipses that we've got this year, doesn't it? Because we've got another ring of fire annular eclipse, the one on the right, but then at the end of the year, and I suspect you're going down to Chile for this, uh, we've got a total solar eclipse, haven't we? Yep, yep. On December 14th, I'll be leading a group. We actually have two groups there in, Ch in uh, Chile and in uh, Argentina. Looking forward to it in Patagonia. Great. Now, I've, I've got another little thing for you to, to look at here because uh, Stephen Ammon, uh, who runs, and this is appropriate because he runs the Syzygy Club, and I'm going to ask you to uh, give us a definition of Syzygy in, in, in a minute. But he came up with this, posted this as a kind of happy new year to everybody. And it's his 29 year, <laughs> a year in review. And he's just got some great facts. Stephen always has these great facts. So he's got here last year in 2019, the moon moved 3.8 centimeters. That's about an inch and a half away from Earth. What on earth is that about, Bob? Yeah, all these things are connected. The fact that uh, the moon is orbiting us and pulls on our uh, <laughs> Uh, on our oceans, there's a little friction there between the ocean and the and the and the uh, sand under it, and so this is causing Earth to slow down its spin. We all know that, but I'll bet a lot of people don't know how gradually that's happening. After a century, each day is one hundred one seven hundredth of a second longer. I'll say that again. If you wait a century, then each day then will be one. 700th of one second longer. Well, it's not much, but it adds up. So that's a loss of energy. And in a, in a system that's uh, linked gravitationally, as the moon is with Earth, if we lose energy, they have to gain the energy. And they gain the energy by uh, increasing their distance from us. They're able to pull against our gravitational field and move farther. Correctly said, 3.8 centimeters, about an inch and a half. Excellent. Now, this second one, I do, a lot of uh, longtime SLU members or haven't people who haven't been around SLU for, for a little while won't necessarily know that we now have the Canary 5 solar telescope that operates during the daytime in the Canary Islands. And we've been getting some marvellous views, actually, Bob. We, we, we talked during the solar eclipse that we're at a kind of solar minimum as far as activity. But these last couple of days, we've seen some huge filaments or huge prominence today, two huge large regions as well. But there's a, this little fact here that uh, Stephen's come up with. The, the, I mean, the, the, this is what I love about astronomy. It's these extraordinary, awe-inspiring figures. The sun lost 174 trillion tons of its mass, and hence Earth's orbit increased by 1.5. So we've just said that the moon is moving away from the Earth, but now Stephen's saying that actually we're also moving away from the sun as well. And that's exactly the same principle, I guess, this transfer of energy. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, that, that comes down to 4 million tons a second, by the way. The sun. Whoa. Yeah, and it's not just abstract or theoretical. If you could put the sun on some kind of giant scale, the sun actually weighs 4 million tons less every single second. Wow. And we'll, we'll skip through these. We'll skip through these other ones, because I, I think that this next one, I mean, they all show that we, we look up at the night sky sometimes and we think it's fairly static and unchanging. But there's this lovely stat that Stephen's got in here. In the universe, during 2019, there were 150 billion new stars were, were born. Now, we see some of these things. We, we see these incredibly young stars in some star clusters. We see them in the Orion Nebula as well, Bob. But we also see in SLU's telescopes the end and death of so many stars a year. And in fact, there was a very recent supernova explosion. And that's a what a massive star at the end of its life. That's right. Well, supernova, one of two different things can happen, either a massive star at the end of its life or in a double star system, you could have a white dwarf uh, gaining material that's floating onto its surface being pulled away from its companion star, and then there's enough on the surface to go kablooey eventually. So one of those two one reasons. One of those two mechanisms. 
Yeah. So and then, you know the the last one in there is just how much the universe is expanding. But the, you know Stephen, thank you very much because Stephen always shares such, such fascinating information, and he he also runs this Syzygy, Syzygy Club uh, at SLU. So let's go back to our Canary One live image stream. While we look at that, and Bob, you're going to tell us a little bit about some moon myths. Um, Syzygy. Why is Syzygy appropriate for tonight as an astronomical term? Yeah, because term? it is Syzygy now. They, uh, people say that's a great Scrabble word, but you'd need yeah. a third Y. And <laughs> exactly. there's only two in Scrabble, of course. So you have to use a blank. I'm not sure you'd want to do that. Uh, but you do have that Z, too. Syzygy is the perfect lineup in all three dimensions of any three bodies. That's what's happening. The sun and the earth and the moon are lined up in all three dimensions. That's the only way that our shadow gets thrown onto the uh, yep. surface of the moon. So it's sy happy syzygy. Syzygy. Actually, we, uh, I don't know if the studio can pull this up because we didn't show it at the beginning of the show. Um, the uh, graphic that we've got of the Earth's shadow, uh, preferably the one without stars, because this kind of will give viewers, I think, uh, uh, some idea of the scale of Earth's shadow. So here we go, Bob, what we've got here, this was at the start of the show, a graphic. Now that middle red circle represents the deep umbral shadow, the central shadow of, of Earth. But just outside of that and reaching out about halfway across the moon is a lighter area, this penumbral outer shadow. So it, this shows us just how accurate this alignment needs to be and what you're explaining in our solar eclipse uh, on Christmas Day is most of the time the sun or the moon because of their tilted orbits of all three bodies they don't make this close alignment so we know that the moon is going around the earth every month you'd think that it would go through earth shadow every single month but yeah, the but earth that five the, degree tilt that five degree tilt is more than yeah. enough so that Usually when it passes the shadow, it skirts above it or below it. So uh, exactly. Uh, and yeah. and as you know, to, to remind viewers who, who weren't in, in our last segment, you know, we're we've got some pretty poor lunar eclipses this year. This is the first of four penumbral lunar eclipses. So we're, we're not even going to get the moon diving into a partial eclipse, which is where part of the moon goes into that red umbral shadow let alone a total lunar eclipse when the entirety of the moon goes in to that central shadow but when did you say bob did you did you have um in your notes the the next total or partial that we've got to look forward to yeah you know, next year and i'll next give year. you the uh, uh, i'll give you the dates i'm actually u using for this you know i have all the uh, total solar eclipses memorized for the rest of the century that that i could rattle off but because lunar eclipses are so uh, uh, less less spectacular than exactly. that. We're going to have the uh, the total eclipse of the moon on May twenty uh, sixth of uh, next year, coming up on next. Okay, year. Total so that's eclipse of the moon. Uh, and these are the ones that are sometimes referred to as blood moons and stuff like that because the moon changes color. But let's go back, Bob, to our live image stream from the Canary One Telescope, and we can do one of two things now. Uh, we've got about ten minutes. So would you like to continue your story of the epochs, the eras of the moon? Or would you sure, like to sure, uh, because the, take the a little look a at myths? Yes. I'm sorry okay. I stepped on you uh, just then. Uh, I was giving you the option that we could talk about uh, lunar myths and how it affects uh, humans oh, and yeah, mental well, illness. Well, and stuff to that, that two, two very interesting uh, and very, very different uh, topics. Uh, you want to do one now and then save another for a little later? Uh, well, uh, we've got about ten minutes, Bob. So see see what you can see what you can muster up in ten minutes. All right. Well, let's finish up the uh, looking at the moon and seeing the history of the moon. We'll 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 just finish that for those who were just joining us late. Perhaps the the, the obvious feature on the moon are those dark blotches called mare, and they are the uh, the uh, ancients call them seas. They're all solidified lava, lava that flow because of impacts from meteors, most of them way back three something billion years ago. And they're all named for either human emotions or for weather phenomena. 
So that's the basics. You look at the moon, that's the thing you'll see with just the naked eye, you'll see those blotches. We started with the uh, that very distinct, separate, isolated, very round blotch on the upper right of the moon near the, the edge or limb of the moon. And at the sort of the two o'clock position, that's Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crises. See, there's a human emotion. Just below it, there's sort of a double large blotch, lower left and lower right. The one to the lower left is the most famous of all of these mares, is Mare Tranquillitatis, the Sea of Tranquility. Tranquility, there's another emotion directly below, uh, to the right of the Sea of Tranquility, directly below Mare Crisium, that isolated round one. Uh, we have the uh, Mare Fagunditatis, the Sea of Fertility. And below the two of those are another isolated and smallest of all little blotches, and that's the Sea of Nectars, Mare nec uh, Nectaris. And that's the oldest, believe it or not. You wouldn't know looking at it, but that's mm -hmm. the very oldest. So when we name the moon for the different periods, we say the Nectarian period, that was almost 4 billion years ago. And the pre-Nectarian is all the oldest period of the moon before there were any blotches on the moon. So pre-Nectarian, Nectarian, what's next? Well, now let's go from all these blotches, go up to the top of the moon and start heading down the other side, the left side. And we get to the largest, almost perfectly round, but huge uh, second largest on all the moon. And that's Mare Imbrium, the Imbrium Basin. Uh, Imbrium, the Mare Imbrium is the sea of showers or rain. Again, remember, it's either human emotions or weather. So this is rain and the Imbrium period. Oh, man, that was an impact. So next came the Imbrium period. Uh, boy, that got filled with lava, didn't it? Yeah. And the Imbrium um, Mare is very interesting because the bottom of it, look at the bottom right, you'll see that white line, which are the uh, a mountain range of the lunar Apennines. And that range points you further down and to the left to the very, very bright white spot, the famous crater Copernicus. Now, it, there's only one more period to mention, and that is those that mountain range, the Apennines. If it was any other phase but full moon, you'd see that the Apennines abruptly end at a smaller crater called uh, Eratosthenes, and the Eratosthenian period is the next period of the moon and ended about uh, 3.9 billion years ago, and actually it began 3.9 billion years ago, and that's when a lot of these craters formed that have rays. Look at all those white lines that come from all of the craters. Uh, it's sort of like um, most of those didn't yet have rays, but when you get to it, leads you to the most modern period, the Copernican period, and that's marked by all those rayed craters. So that's it. That's all I'm going to do. Yeah but just to show you that the different features on the moon, whether the craters have rays or not, and the, uh, the dark blotches, and uh, the biggest blotch, I guess I should mention, on the left side is the very biggest. That's the only one that's an ocean <laughs> that they named. Ricky Oli was the one who named all these things, and that's the uh, Oceanus Procellarum. It's the only blotch or mare that's so big that it was actually called an ocean. And so now you know everything you need to know I mean, I haven't told you that that long, thin one at the very top of the moon is Mare Frigoris, the, the sea of cold, because they thought that was the North Pole, which is close to the North Pole. So that would be the coldest one. And so all of those blotches, again, have names that are either emotions or weather phenomena, and they all tell you about the geological periods of the moon. And, and that, it, that, that, it, can, that can wrap that topic. It, it also tells us, though, Bob, doesn't it, the the history of the kind of material that was flying around our solar system over that four and a half billion years. The fact that those big impacts of big objects happened a long, long time ago. And then as we step forward, the objects impacting the moon tend to get smaller and smaller. Until we reach our pleasant current period where it's rare to have uh, devastating, catastrophic uh, impacts. This was the Wild West years back then, 3.9 billion years ago, that formed all these impacts that got filled with lava. It doesn't do it anymore, thank goodness. Not on Earth and not on the moon, not in the inner solar system. It's become a much quieter and more well-behaved solar system since then.
Oh, well, before we go on to myths, you know, viewers might be wondering, well, OK, there's the moon. It's being bombarded like this. We can see all of this scar material over the moon. The moon's really close to uh, to Earth. So why didn't the Earth get pummeled in the same way or did it? We did. We did. We're, we're, we're bigger and we have 81 times uh, more gravity overall. So we attracted more objects. So, yeah, we got we, we got pummeled, but we don't see the scars around us the way the moon does, because the moon is airless and waterless. And so there's no erosion to, to erase anything on the moon. But on Earth, we have, of course, wind and water and even craters like the giant Barringer crater in, in Arizona. Uh, which formed only 50,000 years ago, which is nothing. That was like, achoo, that was yesterday. And yet that's one of the few that are left. They have to be very recent because erosion erases it. And of course, the even the undersea areas, uh, uh, I've read that every 200 million years, the uh, undersea area is completely remade really? anew. So on Earth, I mean, we have this uh, no-cost cleanup service yeah. Uh, thanks to the wind, the water, the air, the uh, tectonic plates and all the rest that has erased all those uh, scars from those the impacts scars. we had. I mean, we, we, we have discovered more and more impact craters, although, as you say, then they're, they're not incredibly old. But with the advent of satellite imagery and radar you know, from satellites, we have been able to find some of these uh, almost the, the shadows of some of these large impacts under large areas of wooded area. If you stand there, you can't see it. Some of these things are so big, you know, you have to be above the planet to be able to see them. But anyway, Perfect. I want to take you back to one of the seas that you were talking about there, about fertility. Now, is it a myth, Bob, that the moon um, affects human fertility? We know that some uh, that's human fertility, but we also know that the lunar cycle does impact on what certain animals do in their reproductive cycles. What can you tell us about? Yeah, about this that? is a big and old, re really a topic that's been investigated over and over again, mm -hmm. uh, starting with something that everybody has noticed, and that is the period of the lunar phases is 29 and a half days. The actual period that the moon takes to go around Earth which is 27.32166 days, both of those cycles are awfully close to the human estrus cycle. Uh, the, the, the period of menstruation for women is awfully close to that of the moon. Now, could mm. that be, which means our, our, our fertility cycle. Now, could that be coincidence? Now, you can argue one way or the other. To argue in favor of it, you'd say, uh, well, sure, in ancient times, uh, people didn't go out to look for uh, a mate or go out on a date, except at the time when the moon was bright, because it was dangerous out there at night. Uh, other creatures had better eyesight than we did. And, you know, an exciting first date could end early if you got eaten <laughs> by, by, by another animal. That wouldn't be a good way to end, end a date. So we tended to go I've out when the moon was, was bright. And so that happened periodically. So why shouldn't the human body have gradually gotten in sync with the bright nights when it was safer to go out? And then gradually we developed this, uh, this cycle. Arguing against that is the fact that there's only one other mammal that has a similar estrous cycle to humans, and that's, that's the opossum. So you'd have to say, really, only humans and opossums okay. are linked to the moon <laughs> in that way yeah. with fertility, and all the other animals are not? That's sort of, that makes you think it's probably just a coincidence. But, yeah. you know, you could argue it both ways. So now you look for births. Here's something interesting I'll bet you may not have known, Paul, and that is the uh, phase of the moon when you were conceived and by you, I mean just this applies only to you, Paul. Um, okay, just me. When you were conceived, uh, uh, tends to be the same phase when you were born. Because during that whole period of pregnancy, there is an even number of lunations. So that the uh, when your parents conceived you, whatever the moon shape was then, is most likely the same shape that when you were born. Uh, you and, spoil uh, your story there, Bob. Oh, I was two weeks late. <laughs> <laughs>
So, you know, so th th that's a good, interesting, uh, you know, argument one way or the other. We always look for links with the moon. And uh, for a long time, I've heard from teachers. I happen to be married to one uh, who, who says that all the teachers believe that at the time of the full moon, the kids act up and they go crazy. There is a belief that crime uh, cycles on yes, off, I was gonna serious ask you crime, about that. Yeah. phases of the moon. And uh, people believe, and, and births, but a big study back in the late 50s looking at a quarter million births in New York City found there was no link between births and the phase of the moon. And yet, if you talk to people who work in the maternity section of the hospital, the doctors and the nurses, they will all tell you, ah, that's crazy. We've seen it all our lives. There's, there's more births around the time of full moon. We see that all the time. But there isn't. Studies show there isn't. So we have a different question, and the question is just as fascinating. And that issue is, why does it appear to be a link between the moon and crime, the moon and mental health, the moon and births, um, when there isn't, when studies have shown that none of these things are real? For example, mental health? No. Calls to crisis centers don't increase around the full moon. Mm -hmm. Admissions to um, psychiatric hospitals do not increase around the full moon. So, but why do people perceive these things? And there's there's actually an answer to that. Do we have one minute for the answer? Yes, absolutely, yes. Here's the answer. We humans are very good at matching things. For example, we all know that when we sit down to dinner, the phone is more likely to, to ring. <laughs> but the answer to that is that we notice times yeah. when it happens, and we don't notice times when that same link doesn't happen. On any night that we sit down to dinner and the phone doesn't ring, nobody says, oh, that's strange. Exactly. We're having that's dinner strange. and yes. the phone's not <laughs> We notice the link and we don't notice the absence of the link. So because of that, here's the situation. You get the, your maternity nurse on her way to the hospital. She looks up in the sky and sees a full moon like what we're looking at right now with a great slew of telescopes. And most people will call it a full moon even if it's a day or two out of, out of round. They'll see the full moon and they'll say, uh-oh, we're in for it, full moon. And then when they get to the hospital, if there are a lot of births that night by chance, the, the link will be complete. Everybody's going to say, oh, did you see that full moon? We knew it. There's the births. But here's the thing. What if it's a quiet night? And there are fewer births than normal, and it was a full moon. Will anybody say, that's strange, it was a full moon and we've had a quiet well, night? No, nobody yeah. says that. Exactly. So the link, this is human nature, the link gets yeah. reinforced in one direction only, without people even realizing it, the direction toward seeing a link between the moon and the event, whether it's mental illness, school kids acting up, crime, births, whatever. And because of this quality of human nature, uh, there are all these beliefs that the full moon has these influences. And then it's reinforced by the fact that everybody knows the moon pulls on the oceans and that the human body is mostly water. So if the moon can pull on the mighty seas, why, why shouldn't it affect uh, our brains and all the liquids in our bodies? And that's because people don't realize, and I'll, do, I'll finish up with this, that that's not how tides work. Tides only work on large scales. Tides work on the fact that there's a big difference in distance between one side of the Earth and the other compared to the moon. In other words, the moon's pull on the side of Earth nearest to it is stronger than the moon's pull on the side of Earth farthest from the moon because there's 8,000 mile difference and that's a few percent of the moon's 238,000 mile overall uh, distance, it's a few percent. So because of that, the difference in the gravity between uh, the moon's pull on one side of the moon versus the other, the difference is not what produces the tidal effect. It is the tidal effect. A tidal effect is simply a difference in gravitational pull between one side of you and the other. That difference is what is meant by a tidal effect, and Earth has that. But now consider yourself. You're standing out under the moon, moon passes overhead. What's the difference between the moon's pull on your head and the moon's pull on your feet, four, five or six feet 
further away. There is no difference. The tide, the gravity is no different between the two. Because there is no different, there is no torque, there is no pull, there is no, your body fluids, none of them, not your brain, not your eyeballs, none of your body fluids will move even by the width of an atom toward the moon. So there is zero, there is zero effect. I have a related final question for you then, talking about gravity. Sir Isaac Newton once said, just thinking about the moon gives me a headache. So are you arguing with Sir Isaac? <laughs> no, no, he had to because he was starting to realize that the moon does so many different things at once. It's not just that it goes around us every 27.32166 days, but its orbit itself, which is elliptical, not round, that orbit orbits us. In other words, it, it's not fixed in space, but that moon's stretched out orbit has a, has a pull and it uh, advances as the moon goes around. So if we care about when the moon is closest to us each month, perigee, big enough to, let's say, really cause a total eclipse because the moon appears large enough to fully block out the sun, and we want to know, when will the moon next be closest to Earth? It's not good enough to use that simple period of its orbit of 27.3216 days. No, as the moon goes around, that near point, that perigee point, will advance. Jeez. Yeah. So the actual period for the uh, for the from uh, perigee to perigee, which is called the anomalistic month, is not 27.3216 days. It's 27.55455 days. I happen to know this because I like numbers. And that's not the end of it. What if you care about eclipses like tonight's? That's only going to happen when the moon is at a node. You know what a node means, uh, Paul. It means the crossing point of three dimensions. Uh, the syzygy, the Earth, Sun, Moon, exact straight lineup. When will that happen next? Well, it just so happens that involves the tilt of the Moon's orbit, the five-degree tilt. And that tilt itself revolves around Earth. If you can't picture a tilt revolving, imagine dropping a dinner plate on the floor. If it doesn't break, yeah. it might rattle around like this for a little yeah. bit. You know, that's an orbital plane or tilt revolving. And it revolves in a retrograde fashion so that once you have an eclipse like tonight's, and you might reasonably ask, when is the next one? Well, you care about when we'll cross that node again. And so we have a completely different uh, month called the draconic month, or the nodal month, which is shorter than the period that the moon goes around us relative to the stars. It is 27.2122. Uh, two, 21222 days. That's so easy, I almost forgot it. 21.21222 days is the period from the perigee to the next perigee. So here's what Newton was dealing with. It's got that orbit relative to the background stars of 27.32166 days. It's got the orbit relative to its close point perigee of 27.55455 days. It's got a period relative to when it'll cross the next node and be in alignment with the sun and the moon and the earth again of 27.21222 days. And then there's a tropical month. And then there's the, the lunation, full moon to full moon. That's 27.502 days. Are you kidding? No wonder he said just exactly. thinking about the moon gave him a headache. Gave him a headache. All right, Bob, amazing way to finish off uh, your segment. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on uh, tonight's Wolf Moon, oh, the number one lunar thanks eclipse. For, thanks for putting mm. up with me. I actually have to repeat these things oh, once or twice a year, otherwise I'll forget them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Sorry. We'll see you again very soon. Bye Thank now. you. I, I'm surprised you even had me on again after that because I, I, was, <laughs> I somebody has to get a hook and just say, okay, stop this guy. You, you got to stop him. No, we can listen to you for hours. That's why we love these eclipse shows because it means that we can have our big fix of Bob Bowen. So thank you very much, Bob. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, viewers, don't go anywhere. Um, I, I don't know if you managed to spot it, but as we were expecting, you know, we're in the last 10 minutes now of this penumbral lunar eclipse, this very, very subtle lunar eclipse. And as we've been watching this live image stream from the Canary One Half Meter Telescope, that subtle shading that we've been seeing around the four and five o'clock position has been getting more and more difficult to spot. I think I can just about see the remnant of it, um, but I wonder whether 
you can. But anyway, we are going to go uh, for a little short break for one minute, and then we're going to welcome back Dr. Mike Shaw, who runs the Nightscapes Club at SLU, and he's going to tell us how you can take some amazing Nightscape astro photos, probably including the moon, because that's what we're looking at tonight. So don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this short break. Bye for now. And welcome back to SLU's live coverage of the wolf, the full wolf moon penumbral lunar eclipse. Please say that five times fast. My special guest, Dr. Mike Shaw of the Nightscape Club. How are you again, Mike? Thank you very much for joining us again. Very, very good, Paul. I just want to uh, see, if, see if we get Bob to come back. I was just getting geared up on that last bit. Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, mean, I know. I, yeah. yeah, I never, ever get fed up Same. with listening to bob it's yeah i mean know, there's different I, uh calendars and the numbers and the times it's just uh i know it's fascinating know. He, he once explained to me that um he developed this memory as a child where he okay. could read a book or an encyclopedia you know no distractions of these funny little electronic boxes that we're now covered with and he would just absorb it and he just had this capacity to yeah. memorize these big numbers yeah, it's amazing. Small numbers, every kind of number, and these facts and figures. And I do class Bob as an absolute walking astronomical encyclopedia. So I want to ask you, Mike, uh, while we've got six minutes left of the actual eclipse, we're going to go on maybe five minutes longer than that. So we're going to go on to about 20 past. Um, but can you still make out uh, any form of penumbra or shadow? It's tough. I mean, I, if I... It is. If, if you were to show me this image and ask me straight up, I, I would have a hard time arguing for it. I mean, perhaps a little bit, um, you know, just off the, like you say, the four or five o'clock section. But honestly, I would, I don't know that I would, uh, I would put money on that. If you were to show me a before yeah. and after, if you were to show me this image uh, in I, half I, an hour. You know, I agree. I and I, I think that's what I would have to do at this stage. And in so much astronomy right. uh, for discovery and, and spotting things, you mm -hmm. actually have to compare two images right. Uh, uh, right. separated by time. Now, it would be interesting to compare the image that we're seeing now to an image captured using the Starshare camera that hopefully uh, viewers are snapping away at now. But after the eclipse, and just to do a little blink comparison to see if what oh, I yes. think I'm still seeing as a slight shadow is still there, because I've got a sneaking suspicion it's not really there. It's what Bob yeah. was saying. Sometimes when we know something should be there, we like exactly. our brains exactly. like to say it. But anyway, let's get back to the subject at hand. I happen yes. to know a lot of people got DSLR or mirrorless cameras. So the kind of camera now that you can get uh, where you attach different lenses to it. And these are the kind of cameras that you use. Um, and yes. we've got one of your stunning photos that we're going to talk about. So the studio can bring out. There you go. A, a DSLR camera. This is what you use to produce this, Mike. What yeah. <laughs> an amazing image, first of all. I mean, this has got 
art and science combined in one. <laughs> what can you tell us about this? This was 2018, wasn't it? This was January. What I can tell you about this is it's a really easy image to make, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, a lot of times if you look at something that uh, when I look at people playing golf, I think it's just incomprehensibly difficult. But for golfers, it's not hard. And anyone with a camera that would uh, be interested in taking an image like this, um, it really isn't that uh, complicated. It just takes, right. I, I, I guess I've the key to, would be to I've, uh, I've got planning. to stop you there. You're saying this is easy, but how do you get two elephants to stand still for that <laughs> amount of time? I, well, I think you're, all... you're belittling your expertise and capability here. Well, the elephants, uh, I mean, the, mam the mammoths in particular, I had to have my, um, my spray. <laughs> and it's all about the spray. Once you have the spray, I can't tell you where I get that from. But no, I mean, really, okay, what the, the key thing here is to understand, really, the um, the astronomy of eclipses. And that's where the yeah. uh, the point I make with the Nightscapes Club is the astronomers really have an enormous leg up in nightscape photography compared to most photographers. Because most photographers, honestly, uh, they know a lot about photography, but the astronomy is an area where they uh, uh, learn a lot. And you know, conversely for the astronomers. So the, the trick to this image really is to uh, divide this into two main segments. There's the partial phase segments, which are the, let's say, the uh, for the moon. So if you look at the moon, that's the white and black, uh, the, the upper you know, half of the moon shots. And then there's the totality part. So this is a total lunar eclipse in uh, January 30th, I think it was, or 31st, 2018. And the key to the shot is to recognize, and this may not be obvious, is that um, there were a sequence of shots obviously made over a period of time, let's say a half an hour, an hour, a couple hours in this case, let's say. And then every five minutes, um, we would take one of those uh, you know, images five minutes apart and then combine them into a single image. So however many moons there are, let's say there's a couple dozen, it's that many shots five minutes apart. Now, the other thing is that during the partial phase, the partial phase images of the moon, the upper parts, when I exposed for those images, the entire shot was black except for the moon, because the moon was so bright compared to the rest okay. of the the, the yeah. foreground. And then afterwards, just by combining them uh, using basically Photoshop, it's you just keep the lightest part of each image. Those parts were retained and made that nice path into the okay. ground. And then in terms of uh, making the plan for this shot, there's a number of apps that we talk about in our Nightscapes Club that allow any anyone really they're incredibly powerful to plan these types of shots with with great precision so that you really don't leave anything to chance okay now uh we have added on a little bit of time to the show um so that we can talk to mike about some of the initial settings you can use if you've got one of these right. cameras and want to give this kind of thing a try but if you're watching on the uh slu event page if uh the show goes blank at 20 minutes past just refresh the page and you'll be able to watch the end of the show so Very. mike uh we need actually a uh, studio please because we're in the last minute of the penembol eclipse now it's not like a solar eclipse um but we do want to see the end of it even though it's kind of not marked by some spectacular diamond ring or something like this we want to say that we are witnessing the very end within about what is it um look at my clock we got about 15, 16 seconds. There you go, Mike. You know, we're we just go. about at the end of the uh, penumbral, <laughs> the wolf, right. the full wolf moon total. Uh, sorry, <laughs> there we go. penumbral lunar eclipse. The now, I, am I, 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 I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to seeing some animations that some of the oh, I members am quite sure that will have some made. of the members are already working yeah, on so, they will have been snapping away um, from the uh, the image streams throughout the last hour and three quarters, gathering up those images. And I think that animation, just like so much in astronomy, you see an animation, you see an animation of a comet with a tail, and you right. suddenly see the streams and ripples going through the comet's tail. And it's it just right. makes things a lot, lot easier to see. So I'm looking forward right. to that. But anyway, yeah, back to helpful. your subject. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, supernova spotting and moving, just being able to spot Pluto actually against the background stars. You have to right. capture a couple of images, a couple of hours apart or even a night apart to see that, just like Clyde Combao did when he discovered it. But anyway, uh, this is our problem, Mike. We're too enthusiastic about it. We love this subject <laughs> too much. 
we could talk for yeah. hours on it, but we want to do what we promised right. viewers. Um, in fact, look at that. Oh, that's that's cool because the half meter telescope has finished its moon imaging, and that is the first mission from a member controlling right. the telescope. And they are looking at the Horsehead Nebula. If you turn your head slightly oh, sideways, yeah. you can see the Horsehead Nebula and that white line going through it at the top. Yeah. That's a satellite going through. But anyway, Studio, yeah. if you can. Um, hop off those and maybe go back to Mike's uh, Nightscape oh, page. Yeah. And Mike, somebody's just got a DSLR camera. They've been yeah. using it during the day over Christmas. They've captured some great shots of family, friends. They've gone out for a lovely walk on New Year's Day, taken some lovely winter shots or summer shots if you're down in the Southern Hemisphere. And they're thinking, that's really cool. But I've seen some really great images that people have done at night with the Milky Way and constellations and all sorts of stuff like that. If somebody wanted to try that, what do they need to do? What's the simplest way they can do it? Can they use an automatic setting on their camera or do they need to know some other settings to be able to fix no, that up? Great question. So here's my advice to absolute beginners with into night photography is the first piece of advice is to uh, be patient and to um, give yourself a bit of a break because it, it can be a little frustrating if you're doing it all by yourself. The second bit of advice would be to tune into our Nightscapes Club show next Tuesday night and ask questions, and we'll be able to help. But in the, in the field, what I would suggest is in terms of your camera, um, the key thing is to do everything under manual control. So just like Paul said, take it off automatic focusing, take it off automatic exposure, because realistically, most cameras don't really work that well at night. Now, some of the very latest uh, models do surprisingly well, but um, uh, just to be on the safe side, let's put everything into manual focus and manual mm -hmm. exposure. Uh, once you have your camera in manual focus, then I would recommend focusing on the horizon during the day, just manually, yeah. and then using a little bit of scotch tape or, or some sort of tape to tape the focus ring in place. So you've set your focus and at infinity, yes. Uh, and Mike, on that, you know, you say set the set the focus at infinity. You know, uh, camera lenses have an infinity symbol on it. But actually, I've never found a single lens or camera system where lining it up to that actually gives you focus, good focus for stars. That's why you're having to do that manual focus rather than just that's right. moving it to align that, isn't it? OK, that's so right. that's it's, the, it's, it, it. Exactly. Okay, so that's the focus sorted out. So what do we have to do about our exposures then? And presumably that's gonna change if there's a full moon out like tonight versus you wanna capture the Milky Way when there's no moon out. Exactly, so the um, the way that you're gonna do the exposure, it's it's very difficult, <laughs> people hate this, but it, it depends so much on where you are. And like Paul just said, the, the night sky conditions. So if you're in an urban environment, like a city, you're going to have a completely different set of uh, night photography settings than if you're a, in a very dark sky spot, like a, a wilderness desert. <clears throat> so excuse, so the, the place I would recommend starting with is you have three, once you have your camera set up into manual exposure uh, settings, which is not you know shutter priority or aperture priority or automatic or program, but is full manual exposure, then there's three main things that you, uh, will, you're going to want to adjust. The ISO, which is the sensitivity of the, of the sensor, the shutter speed, or how long the shutter is open, and the aperture, which is the uh, the opening that the light comes through. Yep. And for the aperture, I would just set it at the lowest number that you have on your lens and just leave it there, f3.5, f4.0, 4.5, and maybe f2.8. For the ISO, I would recommend starting set, setting it at ISO 3200. Um, that could go up if you're in a dark location, down if you're in a city. And then my advice would be to simply um, use a shutter speed in the range of, let's say, 10 seconds and take a look at the image. If that's not long enough, make it long 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. If it's too bright, decrease it to five seconds. There's a lot of trial. I myself do trial and error every time I yeah. go out for a, a shot just because there's so much variability in the scene. But give yourself a little bit of time and you'll have it dialed in uh, quickly enough. So manual focus during the daytime, fi yep. fix it with some, some tape. Uh, mm -hmm. We're taking it into fully <clears throat> manual mode. We're opening up the aperture to the lowest number, which means it's as wide as it can be. And then we're going to be using an exposure probably between five and 30 seconds maximum. Is that about yeah. the range? Yeah, yeah. Okay. five to 30 and seconds experiment. is a good range. 
It exactly. just exactly and, and try. Sometimes in bright environments, yeah. it's one or two seconds, honestly. Sometimes in the darkest nights, it'll be with a tracker, I'll go even longer than 30 seconds. But 30 seconds is yeah. a practical maximum limit. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it also depends on, you know, whether there are foreground objects that you want right. illuminated, say, by the moon. The moon can actually be a great torch, you know, for when yeah, you're oh, doing some it, nightscape, you know, or maybe to get some silhouettes of the uh, trees or buildings or something like that. So, Mike, when are your shows? They're Tuesdays, aren't they? At what Tuesday time? Nights, uh, for, the, for people in the U.S., it's 9 p.m. till 10 p.m. Eastern time. For people on okay. the UTC uh, schedule, it's the following day, Wednesday. Right now, it's Wednesday um, morning. Uh, 0200. Two, 0200 to 0300 UTC. And, yeah. and uh, we'd love to how have do, you join in. Yeah. How do people listen and where should they be going kind of before the show if they want to ask you questions and stuff like that? Oh, great question. So the, the, it couldn't be easier to join the, sh the, the, the audio cast. And we have a, stead, a, a steady group of followers. All you do is you go to the SLU main page, and in the upper right-hand corner, which is where my hand is in my view, <laughs> there's a little uh, speaker icon, and you just click on that once the slow show is started, and you'll you'll be automatically uh, joined into the show. And then you can listen into the show. There's a little chat box right next to that in the SLU main page that you can uh, introduce yourself, and we'll welcome you to the show and welcome you to the community. And you can, if you have any questions, you absolutely ask your like, Mike, I just used the, your settings you recommended and it didn't work at all. What's what's going on? And we'll say, it happens all the time. I'm blaming myself. Show me your image we can talk about it, and then we'll, we'll fix the problem. And then if you want to uh, join the ongoing 24-7 dialogue that we have going, of course, we have, you can use, we have a Nightscapes club, which is public, so anyone can join. Mm -hmm. And you do that through the uh, club menu on the SLU main page. And we have almost a, you could be the 100th member. Right now, I think we have 98 members Ooh, in the club. So I'm already um, a member, Mike. I think uh, I was one well, of the first. Oh, no, you were one of the first, Bob. To, to, to listeners. I mean, oh, listeners. Have, to, yeah, we should have some type of a, uh, a first light, you know, 100, that is, 100 that is member a of great, the world. That's a great recruiting tool. I'm going to remember this one. You lot out there watching now, you could be the 100th, the 100th <laughs> member. And you're going to be telling so it's going to be. It's going to be 200 by the time the show finishes, Mike. <laughs> so anyway. No, it's, a great, I, it's a great show community. I, I, I highly recommend that. Um, you know, SLU members join the club because it does put a new perspective on it. You're watching the live telescope views while you're doing this. So you're linking up, seeing these, you know, beautiful live images through the SLU telescopes and putting that in the context of your larger nightscape images. And, exactly, you know, Paul. It, it adds such a lot, I think, to the entire experience, I have to say. So I, I'm a great fan, Mike. You know that already. Great, but yeah, uh, uh, Have you got anything else that you, you would like to tell viewers before you uh, disappear tonight? You know, I just always want to say thanks for the chance to be on. It's been great uh, chatting with you, as always, Paul. We always have these uh, areas to go and to listen to Bob as well and uh, exactly. appreciate the SLU community and being a part of it and just wanted to uh, welcome everybody to and Paul of course has his uh, at Astra Club which has yes. a huge following and a great uh, ongoing discussion as well and Bob's got his Strange Universe Club and there's a number of clubs and you can start yeah. your own club if you so choose so it, exactly, it's a great community. Yeah. But that's yeah, all I and it, it, it doesn't matter what your interest is in astronomy. If you're a space enthusiast, there are clubs where you can just collect and share your images. You can share your images actually on the SLU homepage as well as featured observations. Oh. If you're oh. into doing astro processing and making stunning astro photos with the data that comes from the SLU telescope, says the Art of Astrophotography um, Club. If you're into... Oh tracking asteroids and you can join the a team near earth asteroid tracking team if you're into comets we need a good comet mike we are well over to a good We're comet well here at here but we've got the comet tracking club as well it, it really doesn't matter what your interest is if it can be art and literature it can be mythology there's a club there for you and as mike says if you can't find one that's for you then you can make one and of course astronomy clubs can join slu on mass and you get your own club space at SLU. But anyway, uh, Mike, we've we've evangelized uh, e enough, I think, uh, for, for now. Uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And uh, you, sorry Paul. we ran a little bit out of time. But the great news is you're there every night for your Tuesday Nightscapes audio cast. So thanks very much, great. Mike. Thank you, Paul. Well, folks, um, I hope you've enjoyed our, I'm going to get it right this time, full wolf moon penumbral lunar eclipse show tonight.
Uh, thanks to all of the staff at SLU uh, in the SLU studio. Uh, we've got Jack Alley uh, manning the studio. He's actually moving all of that studio equipment tonight because we've got a new office that we're going to in a new studio. Andrew Dumbleton, SLU's ops manager here in the UK, he's been looking after the telescopes and making sure those are OK after the show. And we've opened up the dome fully and all of that kind of stuff, plus a myriad of other staff behind the scenes that keep the great SLU machine running. If only my internet service provider was as reliable as they are. We've actually got one last little bit of news. Uh, Mike mentioned my Ad Astra audio shows. Those are now going to turn into video shows because we're going to be doing once a week a new member orientation show where you can come along. We're going to go through the basics of using SLU every single week. We'll also choose a special subject that we can do at the end, which might make uh, we might look at something a little bit more advanced. We'll also have Q&A in there as well. So keep your eyes open for that. That's going to start in the next 10 days, two weeks max. Uh, so keep your eyes open for that. You're going to be able to react, uh, interact with me uh, using SLU chat. Please, if you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, anywhere else, if you haven't joined the SLU community yet, you are missing something big in your life. Come along, control these humongous telescopes at our two observatories in the Canary Islands and in Chile. And we've also got a third telescope opening in the Middle East later this year. But for now, uh, thank you very much for joining us on our full wolf moon penumbral lunar eclipse tonight. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Bye for now.